Good evening. Well, I appreciate you all uh, giving up part of your Wednesday night to hear our guest speaker, Dr. Kent Dunnington, uh, to lecture, deliver a lecture tonight entitled State Schools and Church Universities. Uh, Kent has worked in and thought deeply about Christian higher education for the last several years. And looking over part of his talk tonight, I think that what he has to say is of vital importance, um, not only for our university here in Greenville, but for the way that Christians in general think about the role of colleges and universities. As he speaks, as he speaks I encourage our audience to think of questions uh, for the Q&A section that follows his lecture tonight. If you're a guest tonight, I'll briefly introduce myself and explain the format for the evening. My name is Colin Fields, and I've been on faculty here since last fall, and also direct our uh, honors program. Uh, I'm really proud of the work that our honors students have done through the years and are currently doing both in and out of the classroom. Uh, and I hope that tonight is a good representation for them uh, of the sort of way that we think about uh, the intellectual life and the, um, the impact of ideas. Our speaker tonight, Kent Dunnington, is a professor of philosophy at Biola University in Los Angeles, California. Kent served on the faculty here at GU in the philosophy department from 2007 to 2015, and he also directed the McAllister program during his time here. He holds advanced degrees from Duke University and Texas A&M University, and is published widely in various areas of philosophy. His areas of expertise is ethics, especially virtue theory. Uh, and his most recent book, published in 2019, is titled Humility, Pride, and Christian Virtue Theory, and was published with Oxford University Press. Another area of Kent's focus is the philosophy of addiction, reflected in his book from 2011 titled Addiction and Virtue. We're very fortunate to have him here tonight, and we appreciate his time. Tonight's events are brought to you through the generous support of the Minoya family, who promote discourse in Christian higher education and missions through the annual lecture that they sponsor here at GU. Former president of GU, James Minoya Jr., has generously donated copies of his book, Paradox and Virtue, to faculty and students this week, uh, and we're grateful for him and his time at GU. More information can be found in tonight's program about the Minoya family and the devoted lives of their namesake, Reverend Dr. V. James Minoya and his wife Florence, uh, but allow us to express our gratitude to their family and the decades of service that they've given here in Greenville, uh, across the country, and across the world. We're also here tonight on behalf of the McAllister Scholars Honors Program, and we appreciate not only the time and the commitment of our honors students through the years, but also the inspiration behind the program. It's namesake Dr. Elvin McAllister, who served on the faculty here uh, from 1956 to 1988 and taught the first honors courses. After Dr. Dunnington's lecture, I'll offer a few comments and questions, after which Kent is invited to respond. Uh, following this, we'll host an audience Q&A, followed by a reception and then Luzader Chapel for the speaker, our honor students, uh, and faculty. Let's welcome Dr. Dunnington back to Greenville and up to the stage. Thank you, Colin, for that introduction. And uh, thank you for coming tonight. It's really good to be here. Um, and it's an honor to give this lecture that is uh, the sort of joint McAllister Manoya lecture um, because, like Colin said, I was, uh, I, I was in charge of the McAllister program for a while. And I also um, was friends with Jim Manoya, former president here. And, um, and I, I uh, am particularly happy to be invited to talk about Christian higher education. It's something that um, I used to talk about with Jim a lot, and I think that um, Jim might hear some of his own thinking and ideas reflected in some of what I want to say. But um, I also just want to say how good it is to be at Greenville. Um, this is a really special place for me, and um, I have so much love for the school, for so many people here, and am loved by so many people here, um, and feel it. So I have just a lot of warmth in my heart for this place. Um, and I want to say that on the front end because it's true, but also because I'm going to maybe take a few jabs throughout this talk. And I want you to know that this is a sort of part of like an internal family dispute. So um, I can be critical of places like Greenville because I, I love them so much, and I hope you'll receive my comments in that spirit. They may just be the angry comments of, like, the rebellious adolescent brother. Um, but I hope not. I hope there's some wisdom in them. And if not, then you'll have a chance to challenge me and, and during Q&A. And I hope you won't hold back uh, any questions that you might have. So the title of my lecture is State Colleges and Church Universities, 
subtitle, Why Greenville Isn't the Harvard of the Midwest. So ten years ago when I was teaching here at Greenville University, which was then called Greenville College, someone referred to Greenville as the Harvard of the Midwest, to which my colleague, Matthias Zahnheiser, retorted that Harvard calls itself the Greenville of the Northeast. Now, what makes both comments funny, of course, is the conventional wisdom that Harvard is the cream of the crop, and Greenville is not. Most would agree that Greenville is looking up, way up at Harvard, but I don't. It's not that I doubt that Harvard has smarter students. They do. Or that they have more accomplished faculty. They do. Or that they have a bigger endowment. They do. Or that their graduates get higher paying jobs and are more likely to become titans of industry and prominent government actors. They are. It's just that despite its shortcomings, Greenville is a real university, and Harvard is not. Just to be clear, I have no gripe with Harvard. My wife went to Harvard, and she turned out fine. Many of my wife's friends who have since become my friends went to Harvard, and lots of them are impressive people and faithful Christians. If I have any gripes, there with places like Greenville University and Biola University, where I now teach. Those places aim to be real universities, at least they claim to, but I'm not always sure that places like Greenville and Biola have a clear sense of what it is that determines whether or not they fulfill their calling to be Christian universities. So in the first part of my talk, I want to explain why I think that Harvard is not a real university. But Greenville is, or at least could be. Then I'll build on that argument to make some further arguments about the institutional shape proper to church universities. And I'll close by making some observations about why it's particularly challenging in this cultural moment to be a church university. So on my view, this is the categories I'm working with, on my view there are only two fundamental types of institutions of higher learning in America. There are state colleges and there are church universities. When we talk about institutions of higher learning in America, we tend to draw the lines differently than that. For instance, we talk about state schools and private schools, or liberal arts colleges and research universities, or junior colleges and four-year schools, or Catholic universities and CCCU schools, or Christian schools and secular schools, and so on. And those distinctions are all useful as far as they go, but I think they can obscure what I take to be a far more fundamental distinction, which is the distinction between a state college and a church university. Some private research universities, so-called, like Harvard, would not describe themselves as state colleges, but that is what Harvard really is, and I will explain why. Conversely, until just a few years ago, Greenville thought of itself as a Christian college. But I think it's always been a church university, or at least it's been meant to be that, and I'll explain why. So now, I wanted to say the terms aren't the important thing here. I'm not arguing for terms. The concepts behind the terms are what matter, and I want to see if I can clarify the conceptual distinction that I'm trying to make between a state college and church university. So, first part of the talk, what is a university? I think the best answer to this question has been given by the 19th century Roman Catholic Cardinal John Henry Newman in his classic book, The Idea of a University. Newman said that a university, by definition, teaches, quote, universal knowledge. To be educated in universal knowledge, Newman says, is to attain that, quote, only true enlargement of mind, which is the power of viewing many things at once as one whole, of referring them severally to their true place in the universal system, or understanding their respective values and determining their mutual interdependence, end quote. That's what universities aim at, Newman said. That's why they're called universities, right? They're universities because they're trying to somehow give us access to something universal. As Newman understood it, universal knowledge is different from what we might call total knowledge. That's what God has. Omniscience is total knowledge, knowledge of all possible truths. Universal knowledge is also different from general knowledge, which is just knowing a fair amount of stuff about a lot of different things, Wikipedia style. Universal knowledge is, and here's the definition, something like an adequate understanding of the human person, the world, and our place in it. It is that at which all education aims, because such understanding is what we yearn for as human beings. 
both to quench our deepest intellectual longings and also to guide us in our practical undertakings. So, one possesses universal knowledge only if one possesses an adequate understanding of the human person, the world, and our place in it. Now, notice I define universal knowledge as a kind of understanding. But what exactly is understanding? It's more than true belief or knowledge. It's not achieved through the mere accumulation of true beliefs. That's why we don't waste our time memorizing the ingredients on the back of a toothpaste tube or memorizing all the numbers in a phone book. That would be a way to increase your knowledge, but it would have no bearing on your understanding. That's because one can believe or even know something without understanding it. I know that engines make cars move, but I can't claim to understand it. I don't know how it works or why it works. So understanding is a mental achievement that includes not just a knowledge of a bunch of propositions, but rather an ordered knowledge of propositions, such that I can explain some propositions by appealing to others. Understanding is a degreed condition. It's not like a light switch. It's like a dimmer. We can have more or less of it. And Newman thought that the kind of understanding at which a university education aims is not total, after all, I had a good university education, and I still can't even explain how cars work. Nor is it general. After all, one can know lots of stuff about lots of stuff, but have little clue how it all hangs together in a coherent unity. But rather, it's universal, in the sense that it comprehends and integrates the major domains of knowledge, such that a person may have a basic grasp of the world and their place in it. Which raises the question, what are the major domains of knowledge? And this is very much open for debate. So, a university has to make judgments about the major domains of knowledge necessary for universal knowledge. Some domains seem obviously essential. Almost no one would dispute, for example, that knowledge of human history, say, or human psychology is central to having a grasp of the way things are and our place in the universe. Other domains seem obviously inessential. You can have a basic understanding of the human person, the world, and our place in it without understanding how engines work, or how soap gets made, or the evolution of the game of Australian rules football. There's all kinds of things that you don't need to know to have an adequate grasp of the human person and our place in the universe. So a university, if it aims to really be a university, has got to make judgments about the domains of knowledge, the integration of which is required to supply universal understanding. The candidate domains are called academic disciplines. If you look at the general education curriculum of any institution of higher learning, including Greenville, you can see the judgments that that institution has made about what disciplines exactly are required to provide universal understanding. That such education is typically called general education is but one mark of the way that universities in America have lost their nerve about the very prospect of universal knowledge. But I think Greenville has something like UNIV, something in their catalog, right? I don't know why they use that designation, but I like to think it was because they believe in universal knowledge. A university is meant to seek and convey to the best of its ability a grand unified picture of the way the world is and our human place within it. Of course, we don't have such a perfect picture, but the university of, is the place that strives for and trains others to strive for such a picture. So, Newman's definition of a university is what philosophers call normative. That means a university is a success term. An institution of higher learning can fail or succeed at being a university. The right to be called a university is something you must earn, and I don't mean from an accrediting agency. An institution of higher learning deserves to be called a university if and only if it succeeds at investigating and transmitting universal knowledge. That is, if it rightly selects those academic disciplines, the investigation and integration of which are essential to an adequate understanding of the human person, the world, and our place in it. And it does not deserve to be called a university if it fails in this endeavor. If it leaves out, for example, an academic discipline that is required to gain a universal understanding of the way things are. And I think you can see where this is going. So now we're in a position to see why Greenville is a real university, but Harvard is not. Or to be more precise, why, if Christianity is true, Greenville is a real university, but Harvard is not. Both Harvard and Greenville aim to be universities. But if Christianity is true, 
Harvard cannot succeed. And that is for a simple reason. There is no Department of Theology at Harvard University. And there are no theology classes in the general education curriculum. So here's the argument in a nutshell. If Christianity is true, then among the truths that humans must know in order to understand the world and the human person are truths such as that there is a God, that God is the creator of the world, that humans are made in the image of God, that Jesus is the Son of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, that Jesus is Lord of the universe, that Jesus died for the forgiveness of sins, that the dead will be resurrected unto judgment, and so on and so forth. Moreover, one cannot adequately understand the human person, the world, or our place within it without access to these truths and without having come to see how these truths bear on every other important domain of knowledge. So that's all the case if Christianity is true. There's premise one. Premise two, Christian theology is the academic discipline that teaches and investigates these truths, their endless implications, and their ramifications into every other important domain of knowledge. Premise three, Christianity is true. Premise four, a university teaches universal knowledge. Conclusion, therefore a university education will include the study of theology. Further conclusion, therefore Greenville University is a real university, but Harvard is not. Now, for all kinds of reasons, many people, including many Christians, don't like arguments like this. I won't offer those reasons here, but maybe Professor Fields will in his response, or you will during Q&A. But from where I'm sitting, this looks like a knockdown argument. If Christianity is true, Greenville is a real university, but Harvard is not. So congratulations. You may not go to Harvard, but at least you go to a real university. <laughs> but what if Christianity is not true? well, then you are not attending a real university. And you are not being equipped with universal knowledge. And if all the other religions are false too, and naturalism is true, Harvard is probably where a real university education is happening. If, however, Christianity is true, then Harvard is not a university. It is a college, a place where no doubt much knowledge is pervaded, But nevertheless, not universal knowledge. Not all the major domains of human knowledge, the investigation and integration of which are necessary for understanding ourselves, the world, and our place in it. Okay, so here's part two of the talk. State colleges and church universities. I've drawn a distinction between schools and universities and tried to explain why I believe that Harvard is not a real university, whereas Greenville is. But I also claim that Harvard should be understood as a state college, despite being called a private university. And Greenville should be understood as a church university, despite often being called a Christian college. What do I mean by calling Harvard a state college when it is clearly private? I mean that it exists primarily to serve the nation state called America. Defending this thesis adequately would require a long historical survey, one which we don't have time for tonight. So let me instead just um, tell you a little bit of recent California history and ask you to reflect on its implications. So for the last several years in the state of California where I live and teach, the state legislature has proposed bills that would invite lawsuits against any institution of higher learning that refuses to hire gay people, or more precisely, practicing gay people. The bills take aim directly at religious colleges and universities who, for religious reasons, whether they're right or not, refuse to hire such persons. These bills do, however, retain an interesting carve-out. It retains a carve-out for those institutions of higher learning, traditionally called seminaries, that specifically train pastors for church work. Now, for the purposes of this talk, please, I ask you, set aside the question of whether gay marriage is compatible with Christian life. Don't get hung up on that. That's not the point. I'm not interested in that question tonight. Rather, ask yourself what vision of the university and of seminaries would make such bills make sense to those who propose them and to the many who would support them in California. And that vision is clear. Seminaries exist to serve the church. Colleges and universities exist to serve the state. Seminaries exist to produce pastors and church workers. Colleges and universities exist to produce citizens in the workforce of America. 
Such a vision is entirely sensible. After all, the federal government gives substantial financial aid to those who attend institutions of higher learning. Many of you, probably all of you, get financial aid from the federal government. Why would it do that unless it trusts that such places will produce people who think and act in the kinds of ways necessary to sustain a democratic policy? The federal government gives enormous amounts of funding to research universities to produce the kind of medical knowledge necessary for the state to act as guarantor of the health of its citizenry. The state mightily funds universities to produce the scientific and technological advances that it requires to compete with and wage war against competitor states. And the state treats colleges and universities as its primary certifying body for entrance into the workforce of the national economy. Many of your parents are fearful of the prospect that you might come to college and yet fail to get a good job. And of course, such fears are understandable. But we must also acknowledge that the state is highly invested in the notion that colleges and universities exist primarily to produce people capable of the work needed to do to sustain the state. And now you can begin to see why theology might struggle to find a foothold in American colleges and universities. It's just not clear what theology has to offer. It does not offer a career path or produce weaponry or cure cancer. It's not just that theology doesn't seem to offer anything the state needs. It's also that theology may well cause problems for the state. After all, the dominant story of the rise of the modern nation state is that it was required to end the wars of religion in Europe. Never mind that the story is not entirely true. What is important is that modern folks believe that religion, if it is not kept private, can tear a people asunder. Theology can get you killed, or worse yet, can lead you to kill others. The rise of the modern state is correlative with the defanging of the church as a source of political power. This is why JFK, for instance, the first Roman Catholic president of the United States, had to assure the American people that although he was Catholic, he would not take orders from the Pope. The American people were confident that Protestants had already learned that religion is irrelevant to the affairs of state, but they feared that Catholics might still be stuck in the Middle Ages. In other words, the modern nation state can be sustained just to the extent that religious people, people no longer think religious claims are worth dying for or fighting for. Such a project is at the heart of modernity and is reflected in the curriculum of universities. So let me give you a simple example. What would you say if I asked you whether theology was a science? Obviously not, right? Sciences are biology, chemistry, physics, etc. But did you know that more or less until the rise of the modern state, theology was deemed a science? It was deemed a science because it has a subject matter, God, about which important truths can be known by way of specific methods, namely the methods of natural and revealed theology. And that method is suited to gain understanding of its object. Today we do not think of theology as a science because it isn't subject to empirical study and, more importantly, it isn't something that can be expected to garner consensus. The sciences thus become the real sources of knowledge, namely those things on which all citizens can agree and in the name of which the state can justifiably coerce its citizens. Just think, for example, about the importance of appeals to science during COVID. Science is appealed to to justify lockdowns and mask mandates. And again, don't get distracted here. I'm not debating whether or not those were good ideas. My point is how science comes to name those domains of real knowledge and everything else gets quarantined as private opinion. That's part of the project of the modern state and the project of the state college. Those disciplines that are called science converge on the things we can all agree we want as citizens of a modern liberal democracy. We want physical health, thus the biological and medical sciences. We want mental health, thus the social and psychological sciences, and we want money, thus the supposed science of economics. The things about which we cannot agree are relegated to the domain of philosophy and theology, the meaning of life, what a good human person is, whether there is a God whom we should worship, etc. And those do not get called sciences because they do not represent knowledge 
Thus, they have no political power, nor can they be appealed to as a justification for state coercion. We have a word for what people think about those questions. We call them values. So there are facts that knowledge get, that science gives you, and there are values, which is what religion gives you. And if all of that just seems like common sense to you, then you know that you have been formed as a citizen of a modern liberal democracy. That's what places like Harvard are for. They are meant to make that seem like common sense. State colleges are the quality control division of the modern nation state. They produce people who can sustain the status quo. None of this is meant as an argument against state colleges. There's nothing objectionable about a political community that produces institutions meant to form people intellectually and morally so as best to sustain and perpetuate that community. That makes perfect sense. My only complaint is that Christians do not believe the nation state is the most fundamental political community. Nor do we think nation states are the prime agents of world history. We believe that the church is more fundamental than the nation, or at least we should. We believe that American Christian and an Iraqi Christian are family, whereas two Americans are neighbors. We believe, or should believe, I suggest, that killing an Iraqi Christian in the name of American freedom makes about as much sense as beating up your brother because he's a fan of the wrong football team. All of which raises the question of whether there might be a kind of learning that serves not the nation state, but the church. That's what a church university is for. The church comprises a real multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-racial, multinational polity with her own knowledge called theology, her own economics called almsgiving, her own formative practices called liturgy, and the spiritual disciplines, her own history called the Bible and church history, and her own heroes called the saints and the martyrs. My modest suggestion is that if there is a people that is served by the Christian university, it is not primarily the state, but the church. Put differently, if Christianity is true, the university exists to produce people ready to serve the world through the church. The church university exists to produce people whose fundamental allegiance is not to the nation state, but to the church. So, I've made a simple argument. If Christianity is true, then only those institutions of higher learning, wherein theology is taught and integrated with the other disciplines or universities, and if Christianity is true, then the university primarily serves the church. It serves the state only indirectly by producing people capable of witnessing to the world in every imaginable way that Jesus is Lord, which is indeed very good news for the world. But so what? This is all pretty abstract. What do these arguments mean for places like Greenville University or Biola University? Suppose that the president and the board and other stakeholders at these universities accepted these arguments. What would follow? Well, let me make eight brief observations before I make some concluding comments about the peculiar challenges faced by would-be church universities. First, I'll make four observations about what I think should characterize a church university. Then, I'll make four more observations about what I think doesn't matter nearly as much as we tend to think it matters for the making of a church university. So first, four things that should characterize a church university. Number one, not surprisingly, a robust theology department. I've argued that a church university is characterized centrally by the study of theology and the way in which the other disciplines are both integrated with and ordered to theology. This means that a church university must have good theologians, and plenty of them. They need theologians who can teach the basics, Bible, church history, Christian doctrine, but just as importantly, theologians who are fearlessly, even recklessly interdisciplinary and who actively work in their research and teaching agendas to display to students and colleagues alike the difference theology makes to the way in which the other disciplines are investigated and taught. I've often thought it would be an interesting project at a Christian university to have resident theologians scattered throughout the schools. Um, not as policemen or anything like that, but as people who are trying to generate um, theological reflection on the discipline itself. 
Maybe this means creating a new class or a reading group where theologians are constantly in dialogue with experts in the disciplines to help them think about the difference that Christ makes to the disciplines. Number two, distinctive general education. As I've said, a church university doesn't really care about general education. It cares about universal education. But just to avoid confusion, I'll stick with the GE label. What counts for general education at a church university will look different than what counts for GE at a state college. And here again, theology will be paramount in the sense that students will take plenty of theology. But just as importantly, the general education curriculum will display a dedication to the integration of theology with the other disciplines. This is usually accomplished through integrative, sometimes team-taught classes where faculty together make judgments and even have arguments about the bearing of Christian truth on the claims of everything from human psychology to human history, economics to chemistry. Sometimes these connections are really strong, and other times they're weak. A church university who thinks that a class on God and math is just as important as a class on God and human psychology just hasn't thought very much about the difference that theology makes to the disciplines. Number three, prioritization of general education. So the achievement of a universal education is the task of so-called general education at a church university. That is, these are the courses that all of our students must take if they're to claim to have received a university education. As such, general education at the church university is more important than majors. Indeed, one can conceptualize a church university without majors at all. But one cannot conceptualize a church university without an organized study of those disciplines necessary to provide universal understanding with theology, ordering and integrating them all. It is one of the ironies of our current moment that more and more students get their gen ed at community colleges or cheaper four-year colleges and then come to the Christian college for their major. What could be more confused than, and I'm sorry if some of you did this, but I'm here to tell you it's very confused. What could be more confused than going to Kaskaskia College to learn your philosophy, psychology, history, and economics, and then coming to Greenville University to major in engineering? Of course, given financial pressures, schools like Greenville often have no choice but to take students any way they can get them. However, it is striking how few faculty at church universities are bothered by such arrangements. If our faculty and administrators cannot even see how confused such a program of study would be, is there little wonder that parents and students think something like this makes sense? I have long said that a church university would be more sustainably intelligible if it were only a so-called community college. Better to offer nothing but universal education and send students off to the University of Illinois to become engineers than the reverse. But of course, the financial pressures and incentives at present make a two-year church university model nearly impossible. Although if there are any super wealthy donors out there that would like to see that happen, uh, give me a call. Number four, ecclesially vocational. Will Willimon, a theologian at Duke University, tells about a parent who called him on the phone, mad as hell. My daughter came to Duke to study finance, the parent explained, but she took one of your theology classes and now she wants to be a nurse in inner city Durham. You've ruined her. Willimon says that he hung up the phone with a smile on his face because he finally had evidence he was doing his job. The church university has to be willing to ruin its students for the meritocratic ladder climbing of the American economy. Such willingness is frightening to many of us. Frightening to me, honestly, the older I get. We often lack the confidence that Christians are called to a life that really is more exciting, rewarding, and meaningful than what the world has to offer. But if we have lost that nerve, then we are no longer a church university. Church university faculty serve as missionary outposts of the church universal, as do all faithful Christians. Their work is a calling to serve the world in the name of the Lord. Thus, the status and wealth-driven vision of what counts as a good career in the American imagination has got to be repudiated. It's fine, of course, to have some Christians in finance. But we know something has gone wrong when, as is the case at Harvard, all, all of our most capable students end up in finance. For the church university, such an outcome would reflect its failure to help students see their work as their participation in the service of the church to the world. And now four common errors in thinking what a church university should have to look like. Number one, Christian students. Many have thought that a church university must have students who are all Christians. 
Biola University, the school that I teach at, tends to think this way, but they're wrong. What makes a university a church university is the universal education it offers. It can offer it to anyone who wants it. It can and should hope, of course, that such an education will form Christian students, but this is God's business, not ours. Number two, Christian faculty. Most Protestant church universities have assumed that all faculty should be Christian. This is not essential either, as evidenced by those Catholic universities that maintain their primary orientation as a church university while hiring plenty of non-Christian faculty. This can be and is, in fact, hard to pull off, and it requires care. For example, such a university will need its theologians to be Christian, which is redundant, really, and it will need its non-Christian faculty, and this is the hard part, to be open to having their discipline integrated and positioned by theology. This takes a special humility, one that is at odds with the disciplinary dispositions that graduate education in America instills. But it is nevertheless possible, and there are Christian, Catholic in particular, universities that are engaged in this experiment with more or less success. So, number one, doesn't have to be all Christian students, doesn't have to be all Christian faculty. Number three, doesn't have to have a lot of Christian programming. Christian dorms with Christian Bible studies, Christian student groups, Christian sports teams, and the like are all incidental to a church university. They're not the heart of the matter. Indeed, if we believe that the co-curricular formation is really where the action is at for church universities, we should just give up. I suspect that kind of programming is better carried out by parachurch organizations like InterVarsity and Crew anyway. Of course, there's nothing wrong with having such program at a church university, but once you think that's essential or even core, you're on your way to confusion about the heart of a church university. Let me put it this way. The decision about whether or not to host Bible studies on each dorm floor is far less important to the intelligibility of the church university than the decision whether or not to invite ROTC to campus. That so many Christian college administrators see no imaginable problem with having ROTC chapters at their college is one sign that we have forgotten what determines a church university. Notice I'm not saying it would be impossible to have a ROTC chapter, only that it would require, should require, a great deal of conversation and discernment about how to do it in a way that's faithful. One thing I should mention here is chapel, and I mentioned it with fear and trembling, but what are you going to do? What are you going to do to me? Not invite me back? A vexed subject for sure at church universities. This is too simplistically put, and I've open comments, of, uh, I'm open to questions about this during q and A. I I think this might be an area where I'm potentially wrong, but here's what I think. Either chapel is education or it is worship. If it's education, then it should be simply folded into the general education curriculum. But if it's worship, as chapel should be, then it cannot be mandated. Christians do not believe in coerced worship. Coerced worship is an oxymoron. I suspect that the mandatory chapel requirements at church universities are often a result of the mistaken assumption that the main task of the Christian university is to keep the students Christian. That is, of course, what many parents hope for when they send their children to Christian schools. But again, that is not the mission of a church university. The university is principally where the church does its thinking, not where it does its worship, nor where it converts and baptizes disciples. And finally, residential liberal arts ethos. For historical reasons, many people think that a church university will be residential and liberal arts focused. I have no complaints against residential liberal arts colleges. I went to one, and it was great. But this model is not essential to the work of a church university and can, in fact, work at cross-purposes to the goals of university education. For example, residential learning is expensive, and it tends to pull people away from their families and local communities. It privileges those who have money and those whose notion of success includes a kind of social mobility that threatens perpetual deracination. It is not clear why Christians should unquestioningly support such priorities. Furthermore, Christians have no special devotion to the liberal arts. And this may be where Dr. Manoia would strongly disagree with me. Except in the most general sense of an education that prepares a person for the difficult work of being truly free. But the liberal arts have often been associated with the project of being a quote-unquote whole person, 
over and against being vocationally trained. A church university will resist such a distinction and challenge the presumption that human flourishing can be kept separate from finding one's proper place in the church's loving service to the world. So, concluding comments. I am aware that my talk will seem quaint to anyone in the room who has the slightest understanding of the financial pressures that all institutions of higher learning face today. Here's what my imagined objector says. We're not in a position to dream up a utopia and then hope the students show up. We'll die overnight. We have consumers called students and parents. And if we don't give them what they want or something in the ballpark, we're done. All of these conceptual distinction and arguments are nice, but utterly irrelevant to the work of sustaining an institution of higher education. Well, I'm sympathetic, and I wish I had a good response. I'll do the best I can. I'm especially sympathetic in the case of the church university. For although the state college has challenges, at least there is little doubt that there is a public that wants what it offers, namely certification for participation in the American economy, also known as the American dream. But it really has become doubtful whether there is any longer, in America at least, a church that wants a church university. For one thing, the church is shrinking in America and in all of the so-called developed world. For another, even the church that is left seems to no longer look to the church university for the production of church men and church women. That used to be more true back when denominations mattered, when you could expect that the church folks would send their children to the denominational college to become good Methodists or Baptists or whatever. That ship has sailed too, for better or worse. It seems that the most we can hope for from church folks today is that they can still be interested in Christian education. But even here, the cynic might wonder whether what they really want is a place where their children are just a little less likely to consume excessive amounts of drugs and alcohol and engage in promiscuous sex. So, one can certainly forgive a president of a Christian university who struggles to see why a strong theology department in a general education curriculum that is robustly integrated around theology would make any positive contribution to the bottom line. I'll offer two comments in response to close. First, I want to point out that what I have proposed as the core of a church university requires little by way of expenditure. No new dorms or dining halls, no football team, no fancy institutes, no new administrative or staff positions. What it really requires is a faculty, including especially theologians, philosophers, and others carefully trained to think about the difference Christian faith might make to the production or transmission of knowledge. Many church universities have such a faculty who simply need to be invited and challenged to recover the core vision of a church university. Others need to make a, str a few strategic and bold hires, perhaps being willing to cut in places where the vision of the university has been overtaken by the prevailing winds of consumer demand and the powerful influence of the state college model. And who knows, but that God can still sustain such places even if they do sometimes ruin a student's life in the eyes of parents. Such universities should be clear with their students from the outset about their central purpose, which may make marketing a little more difficult. And also unapologetically explain to their students that if they are successful, their students are expected to continue to support financially and otherwise the work of the university that so shaped them. Christian church universities need not be afraid about asking their alumni for money if they've actually done what they said they were going to do. So I do have hope. We Christians, we, we have to have hope. We're supposed to. But just as importantly, we have nothing to fear. The kinds of American institutions that are or could conceivably become genuine church universities are historically very contingent. The church has thrived and is now thriving in places where there are no church universities. At least nothing that fits anything like the description I have given. Conversely, the church has withered and capitulated in ages and places where there are many such institutions. Contemporary America, for example. Those of us who care about the future of the church university ought, therefore, not overestimate our importance. God has promised to always have a faithful people called church, but God has not made such promises to the church university. God may use us, 
But there is nothing to suggest that we are an essential part of God's economy. I have said that the university is where the church does its thinking, but it is not the only place, and should church universities wither up and die, no doubt the church will continue to produce the people needed to do the work of Christian thinking. One need only think of the patristic fathers of the church to see that God can produce thinking Christians without the church university. As such, we are free to fail. This should be good news to those of us who care about the church university. We are quite unnecessary. And we are therefore free to be a peculiar kind of experiment. Such freedom should make the church university even more strange and interesting than it already is. Thank you.